Good morning. Welcome to Heritage Church. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're new to us, we just want to say welcome. And uh, man, I'm so thankful to look around and see our family. Will you give it up for our ushers and the offering team and the, the guys in the back? Jonathan Drew were just up here carrying this table for me. I don't know what I could, I couldn't do it without them. I just, <laughs> and I give them a hard time. We, we go back and forth a lot. Man, carry your own table. I'm like, well, what would you do? I mean, I don't know. I, um, but they're, they're great friends and such a, a blessing to our church to do so many other things. And um, they're, they're friends of mine. So we're, we're glad that you're here. And I, I just want to invite you this morning for a few minutes. Can we just sort of take off the formalities? And I, I, if you know me, I'm not really the formal guy. So uh, we have come together. We've gathered together uh, as a group of people that uh, I look around and y'all look different. And uh, you have different styles going on and different uh, we come from different places. There might be some river rats in the room, and that's my people, you know. Might be some uh, city folks. Might be some preps. Might be, I don't know, might be some thugs. I, I, we, we're all different, right? But we're here today to lift up the name of Jesus. And it's our hope that, uh, that I believe it's our hope that as we come together that we bring the people that are important to us, people that we love and we care about. And our, we, we hope that somehow we can impact their lives lives and that they would encounter the living God, right? And that they would experience him as well. And so this morning, I'm just overwhelmed by the fact that uh, it is the grace of God that allows us to come together. You know, we probably wouldn't, we may not hang out to get together in other places and other things. And uh, we, we may have different hobbies and, but it is the name of Jesus that unifies us and brings us together. And it's the grace of God that allows us to tolerate one another, Tolerate, we come to church and we tolerate each other sometimes. We might, you, you might tolerate me this morning. I'm so loud and, you know, you might be like, boy, I wish you'd just take a chill pill. It's so funny because me and my wife are opposite. She's quiet. She don't talk a lot most of the time. And then I'm loud and I talk most all of the time, okay? And so we're opposites of each other. And so when everybody else is kind of smiling and laughing and there's Mark, he's making a joke and he's a center of attention, she's in the corner. I'm like, my God, when would this be over? And then I look at her and she's like, hey. <laughs> she's so, she knows how, but we tolerate. It's the grace of God that allows us to tolerate each other. And, you know, when we come in and we sit beside each other and someone's got, I love putting on cologne. I, I put on cologne in just a way. My, my method of is just enough for you to smell it, right? And when I was younger in high school and single, I'd put just enough on for the girls to notice and want to come in close and get a better scent. You know what I'm saying? I probably shouldn't have said that in church. Anyway. But, you know, people, we tolerate each other. It's the grace of God that allows us to tolerate. And listen, I want to ask you this. What relationship in this room can survive without the grace of God? And for anyone who's been married for any amount of time, you know your marriage can't survive without his grace. And if you have teenagers, you know your relationship with your teenager won't survive without grace. And if you've got a friend that you've had for a long time, you've probably hated him once or twice in your life. It's the grace of God that keeps allowing us to fellowship, to come together. And so I don't know that you'll always like me, and I don't know that you'll always smile at me. But this morning, I'm excited that the grace of God is in the room. And it's because of the grace of God that you might smile at me again one day. Right? That you tolerate me, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And I'm just overwhelmed with that thought this morning. I'm thinking about people in my life that in my years, I was younger and dumber. And I'm sorry, I, I do believe the younger I was, the dumber I was. So the older I get, the smarter I get. Anybody? Anybody say amen to that? Like, but I did some things that hurt some people. And I've said some things that have hurt people. And I've disappointed people. And I've handled situations wrong. And I can't go back and fix them. All I can trust is that the grace of God can. That the grace of God can. But I can promise you that I'm not what I was. I'm not who I was. And I'm thankful to God. My mama would say, thank you, Jesus. He is not what he used to be. I am changed. Anybody have that testimony? I'm a work in progress. 
And I'm sitting here, this guy playing the guitar this morning, Paulo Vargas. I told on us this morning. I didn't ask him his permission. But he is, uh, I, we, when we were younger, we were both dumber. And we both had opinions and we didn't get along. But by the goodness of God, the grace of God, here we are today. We worship together and we have a great deep appreciation. It was the grace of God that kept us together. And so my question is, again, how can any relationship on this earth survive without his grace how can your relationship with him survive without his grace it can't it can't that's the answer you're in desperate need of him this morning whether you know it or not we all are and so I'm picking up in Galatians 3, and I, I, I hope to get through verse 7 this morning, and, and we're just going to continue. And uh, I had someone ask me last week, hey, what's the new sermon series? I said, Galatians. And like, again? And I said, yeah, I get it, right? I know, you know, it's like, but yes, we're going to be here. No real definitive answer for how long, but I've enjoyed going back and forth. And uh, where, where Brad's left off, I pick up. And where I drop off, Brad's picked up. And so uh, this morning, I am honored to be standing here with you and, and to share. So Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. And if you're new, forgive me, I get pumped up. I'm kind of like that high school coach on the sidelines. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like, come on, you know, you got, yeah. Yeah, I get amped up with it, all right? So. Uh, but my heart and my intention is I want to just come up here and talk so calmly. <laughs> I, tell, I tell myself all the time, I make notes right here. Slow down and talk softly. And it'll work for about 10 seconds. <laughs> and then I'm like, ah, <laughs> you know, oh, we got this. You know, like, I'm sorry. So tolerate that for me. Give me grace, you know. Uh, but I want to share from my heart. I want to give you what's in my heart. Verse 1, he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. We read in Galatians 1 where Paul was saying to them in the beginning of his letter, I am shocked. I'm astonished that you have so quickly turned from the one who has called you into the gospel of grace. But by the time Paul's writing chapter 3, that little bit of sh between shock and awe has disappeared. And now he's upset. He's like, you foolish Galatians. Like the more he thinks about it, the more he sees what's going on. He realizes the enemy has come in to rob. The enemy's come in to steal and to kill and to destroy. And he's really trying to get their attention. And so he says that with more intensity, you foolish Galatians who bewitched you, who charmed you. You ever saw anybody with charm? You ever say, well, that's a charming individual right there. What's that mean? It means, well, they just kind of get to have their way. Right? Who charmed you? Who charmed you? Right? Who whispered to you? Who seduced you to believe something different? Who put a spell on you? Who sold you on that idea? Who changed your mind? What did you hear that drew you away from God's grace by faith back to circumcision? What changed your mind and made you go back to works and leaving grace thinking that you could do it on yourself? Who has bewitched you, Galatians? And so I have a question. I, I, as I'm thinking about this, what is it that's so tempting? What is it that's so tempting about being in control of our own lives? Does anybody struggle with that? Hans, anybody, anybody sitting next to a know-it-all? Don't. Don't tell on them. Because if you said that they were a know-it-all, that means you're the know-it-all. <laughs> you, you actually told it on yourself. I listen it's the way I am so I just believe that you are too that I'm in a room full of know-it-alls I'm in a room full of people that if they're left to themselves you will completely trust what you see what you know and how you interpret it and you will not trust anyone else if we are left to ourselves that's how we will operate so what is so tempting about being in control of our own lives our own destinies what is it that's in us that wants to prove that we've got it all figured out why is it so challenging? Why to sit back and let someone else do it, to trust that they can and they will do it? Why is it so hard to go to our Father and admit and say, oh God, you're my only hope. 
I cannot do it without you. And that is the truth, Jesus. We can't make it without you. All right. And so there's a little phrase that was it's called the drift. We begin to drift. And so I commercial fished for many years. I was a grouper fisherman. Anybody ever done any of that? I went out for two or three days at a time, rode out hurricanes. I've been in water, 45-foot boat, and waves just rolling over the front of the boat, right? And so we get on the fish, and, and when you're on the rock and they're biting, it's like bam, 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 bam. I mean, it, it will wear you out, rod and reel. I had an electric reel in my rod and reel. And, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of that, it just stops. It just stops. And, and a lot of times, they just quit. But then there were some times that we'd go in and look at our anchor, and the current had changed, and the wind had picked up. And next thing we know, we didn't have enough anchor line out, and our boat began to drift away from the spot. And so what we had to do was re-anchor ourselves back in location. And so I'm going to tell you, as faithful men and women of God, it is our responsibility by the studying of God's Word to grab ourselves at times and re-anchor ourselves ourselves back in the truth because if we're not careful we will drift we will drift and that's what's happened a lot of times in the church it is such a tempting thing to drift into one location and that is I got it I got it I can do it on my own I don't need no help from nobody and if we're not careful, we'll go to God. And that's what we say to him with our actions. That's what we say to him and how we live. I got it. I'll go to church. I'll pay my tithes. I'll be a good little Christian. I'll be what I think I'm supposed to be. And God's saying to us, that doesn't cut it. That isn't enough. There's only one offering that's enough, and that's the offering of Christ Jesus. And so I have three boys, and I just want to tell on all of them, they're all three just like their daddy, and they got it too. Anybody raising any uh, know-it-alls? <laughs> the sweetest boys you ever met. I got a 24-year-old, 20, he's 24. Woo! Going to get married soon, and I, I'm 21 tomorrow. Mark's birthday was tomorrow. Thank you for all the birthday wishes, by the way. I'm looking good for 35. No, 47. I can't believe it. I'm three days away. I'm three years away from the, my, anyway, my dad died at 50. We won't talk, we'll talk about that later, okay? But the reality is, is I got three boys, 24-year-old, one that's about to be 21 tomorrow. He stole my birthday, basically. We don't celebrate me. We celebrate him now. I plan at 22 to get that back, okay? <laughs> like, hey, you're 21. Go find a family to celebrate you. I got my own here, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I got 11 year old and I can tell you there's not been one time in my life that I sat them down with it was fishing hunting how to operate anything I showed them one time and immediately see them doing it wrong and I go to try to stop them I, I got it anybody anybody know what I'm talking about and so a few years ago I was preaching a funeral right here in South Georgia and and it snowed and it snowed, and so I was down in my office getting ready for that funeral. And in pops my old my oldest son. If you know him, he's a he's boy, he's a charmer, but he's a goofball too. You're like, hey, Dad. I'm like, what are you doing, son? I'm just out around driving around checking out snow, you know. And so here's the deal: I just bought him this little Chevy truck. It wasn't the nicest thing in the world, but it was a little 4.3 V6 with a stick shift. And to be honest with you, it was a truck that I wanted. I would love to have had the truck. And I'm like, I'm going to keep this truck and be in my family. I will give it to his kids one day. You know, like everybody's going to drive this truck and it's coming back to me till I die. I was, that's how I felt about it. And so I had just spent about $4,000 owed the mechanic for the job. This little boy is in that little truck. You know, he's sporting around. He's checking out the snow. I told him, I said, well, Caleb, thank God you're okay and you didn't die on your way here because you have never driven in this kind of ice or snow. It is dangerous in South Georgia do not go anywhere until I get done with this funeral and when we get done we can go anywhere you want to go all right and you know what I knew the minute I said it and the way he smiled guess what that fell on dumb ears I come up here to do the funeral I get done with the funeral I go down to south campus to we're having a gathering and the sweet one of, the, one of my great friends Miss Darlene Cox she come up to me and she said I am so sorry that Caleb was in an accident is he okay 
I said, accident? She said, you didn't see his snap? I'm like, we're not friends on snap. <laughs> oh, you didn't know. And boy, she, I mean, you know, she's like, uh oh. <laughs> and so there Caleb Cunningham was. He left my office. He drove about three miles, went to make a turn. He was just going to turn around. And when he did, he hit a, a, just a whole thing of ice. And he took that truck. He says about 15, 20 miles an hour, but I've been doing paint body for most of my life. That's what, that's what I did for years. I did a lot of things. But anyway. He hit that pole so hard, it, there was gaps all the way around that ground, and that, there was a moon just cut in the front of that truck. He bent the frame. He hit it so hard, he bent the frame. The motor cocked inside the truck frame, and the starter grounded out and burned up the battery. He's on the phone with his mama. Mama, uh, all I need is a battery. <laughs> bring me a battery. <laughs> you know what he's thinking? If somebody bring me a battery, daddy ain't going to kill me today. Because it wasn't just a, I mean, I just said, don't go anywhere. What is it that makes us think we got it? We can do it on our own. And I want to tell you, as soon as I, I found out where he was at, I went and I didn't give him an ounce of grace. And when I got done, I needed all kinds of grace. I wish I could tell you different, but I can't. All right. <laughs> But what is it that makes us think from an early age? And I'm going to tell you, that boy, that kid, he's still, that's still how he operates. He got, boy, he got it, got it, you know. And I'm sitting there, I, I'm, I'm talking, and I'm hearing God say the same, same thing to me. He's asking me the same questions. I'm telling Caleb, hey, here's what I have planned for your life. I, I was going to do this. If you'd done this, you graduated. and was going to hear, I, this is what I wanted to see you do. Do you like the way that sounds? He's like, I love it, Dad. I said, well, it didn't happen. <laughs> You know why? Because you've been steering. You haven't let me steer. You've been steering. And as I'm saying that to God, I hear God saying to me, Mark, I want to do this, this, and this, and this with you. Do you like the way that looks? I'm like, yeah, Daddy, I do. He said, well, it didn't happen. Why? Because you didn't let me steer. We got to surrender to God. We got to let him know and let him be in charge of our lives. And so... See, anyway, if we're not careful, we'll drift from trusting God and drift from waiting on God and we'll trust in ourselves. And that's what Paul is continuing to address in Galatians. It reminded me of a verse I want to read to you in 2 Timothy 4. He says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. He then says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort, and complete with patience and teaching. Verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate to themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will accumulate teachers. They'll, they'll have a desire. Tell me what feels good to me. Tell me what I want to hear. They'll grab teachers that tell them those things. And listen, I've quoted this scripture and I've heard it preached and it was mostly about behavioral issues and not really about the heart and, and, and acknowledging the power of the cross. Here's the real temptation people love gospels that tell us how powerful we are they want messages that tell us how strong we can be and what we can overcome but that is not the truth you'll never be powerful without him he is the only one who is powerful yeah go ahead so if we're not careful, we'll be charmed to fall into works-based gospels that depend on how big we are. When the truth is, you have to admit how small you are and how little you are and how weak you are and how strong he is. That is the truth. That's what Paul is preaching in Galatians. Why are you running to a gospel that says it's in your hands? Because mankind has a tendency to drift to doing things. We want to be able to be a part of our solution. We want to fix the problem ourselves. We want to lean on our ability, our understanding. And God's saying, if you want me, if you want to have me in your life, you're going to have to admit that you cannot do it. And so we thirst for power and control and knowledge. 
The more we think we know, the better we feel about our situation. But your knowledge does nothing at the cross. Your knowledge will accomplish nothing for your salvation. He is the only one who can save. He is the only one. And so in verse 4, he says, They'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths, made-up truths, man-made narratives, and bedtime stories. And then he says, Timothy, be sober-minded, be calm, endure suffering, do the work of the evangelist. Timothy, preach the good news of the gospel of God's grace. Timothy, preach salvation through Jesus and what he did on the cross. Timothy, preach that you have an inheritance by faith in Jesus. Do the work of the evangelist. And then he says, Timothy, fulfill your ministry. Do what God has called you to do. And then he says in verse 6, for I am being poured out like a glass of water, like a drink offering. He's referring to a tragic death. What he's actually saying is my blood is being poured out of me in a violent death and my time has come to die. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And then he says something so important I have kept my faith in God and I want to say to you this morning protect your faith protect it guard it it's the most precious thing you'll ever have what does it mean faith is to believe in the power of God and not yourself somebody comes up to me and says I just can't do it I'm like I know I know you can't. I know you can't. Without his presence, you can't. I hear people telling me, hey, I'll get it right. When I get it right, I'll come. You'll never get it right because you don't have the power. You don't have the ability to get it right. He's the only one who can get it right. Come fall at his feet. Fall down in front of him and lay it all out and say, you can have everything I have. Use me. So what did Paul die fighting for? What faith did he guard until his death? We're learning all about it in Galatians. He died for the gospel of grace through faith in Jesus. That's why he died and that's what he died for. So let me say it like Paul said it to Timothy, to you. This morning I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. The one who's to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his kingdom. Guard your faith. Keep your faith. Fight for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, he is more than enough. And don't be tempted by a gospel that puts you in control. So here we are again. Paul just keeps teaching and preaching about grace. The man, you're going to keep preaching about grace? I don't know. I thought about going to Thessalonians, but there's grace. <laughs> we can go to First and Second Timothy, but guess what you'll find? More grace. You can go into Romans. You know what you'll find? More grace. Everywhere you look, it is the message that he has to preach. It is the gospel that we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. (laughs) And that's good news, right? There's only one gospel. There's no deviating from the truth. And listen, I understand the perspective that's concerned about, I heard a phrase years ago, sloppy grace. Concerned about people living selfish lives in full pursuit of personal pleasures which lead to sin. How can a person, I want to ask you this, how can a person live a selfish life, build a life of shambles, look back and have regret everywhere, and then in a moment meet the grace of the living God, experience the forgiveness of Jesus on the cross, and be forgiven and covered of those sins, and then walk away with nothing but selfish desires? I want to propose to you that they can't. You can't. When you see what he's done for you, you can't live for yourself. You can't. Your heart will be filled with worship, a desire to let him lead, a desire to let him be in control. And let me ask this question too while I'm asking questions. When does a life, at what point does anyone in this room get to a point that you need grace, the grace of God on occasion? 
Huh? When, when did it become some days or in some moments? When did there become a crowd that needs grace desperately and a crowd that needs God's grace on occasion? And who here today can boldly proclaim that you're not in need of the grace of God in this very moment? Romans says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all desperate <sighs> to the person that feels like the lowliest this morning. Put yourself beside Paul and he would say, along right beside you, I am desperate for the grace of God. We need him every day and every moment. And we'll need them for the rest of our lives. There are only two crowds this morning. They're the ones who know they need the grace and the ones who do not. And I know it might be tempting to point at people who have lives that are messed up and say, yeah, they don't know they need the grace of God. And I would beg to differ with you. I think there's so many people that know they need the grace of God, but they have experienced religion and not the love of Christ. And so they feel like they could never experience what it means to be forgiven. But here's the real danger. The people who have gone to church the longest the people who have been around the longest, something starts to creep in, and you know what we start to think? If we're not careful, I got it. I got it. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I witness. I, I sing songs. I listen to worship music. I got it. Our works this morning, they are nothing but an offering of worship. Our works will not justify us before the living God. So like an army in the trenches fighting to hold our ground, I want to encourage you this morning, let's contend. Let's endure for the gospel of grace through faith. Let our lifestyles declare who the Lord of our lives is, not because we feel trapped and forced to repent, but because we see clearly the gap between us and the living God. Because we can see the gap that is impossible for us to close. It's impossible for us to cross. It's impossible for us to fix. And we can see clearly that it is Jesus us who is the bridge that it is Jesus that came to us it is him who sought us out and he is still in full pursuit and because of that we are overwhelmed with a desire to show our gratitude it's a pleasure to repent it's a pleasure to acknowledge it's a joyful place to surrender to Jesus and acknowledge that he is Lord of all and that he is in control Yes. So I want to, yes. I want to say right now, glory. Glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is the one, right, who is able to open the Lamb's book of life. Holy is the one who stood in between you and I and the wrath of God. Worthy. He alone is worthy. He's worthy. He is worthy. Who can open the book? There is one. And so I once was concerned about those who preach too often about the grace of God. Listen, I'm just confessing I was concerned that people weren't being taught how to live. And to be honest with you, I was more performance-based than I want to even admit today. And I couldn't see clearly the wonderful, powerful, amazing grace of God. And my picture of the cross was more about telling people how to live right instead of telling them about the one who did live right. And the one who not only lived right, but now he stands before the Father and he will make you right. It's not as though you'll wake up tomorrow morning perfect. It's that the fact that there is righteousness standing between you and the wrath of God. And because of that righteousness, you can now experience the presence of the living God. So don't fall prey to the charming spirit of a performance-based gospel. Jesus said, many will say in that day, Lord, look at all that we've done. We've cast out demons in your name. We've healed the sick in your name. We've raised the dead in your name. We've preached in your name. And then he says, I will say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. We never knew each other. What's he mean? He's saying, listen, none of your works will earn your spot in heaven. And if you think it's by your works, then I don't know you. Well, that's hard, isn't it? Your works, my works, they're acts of worship. 
They carry no power to defend us against the punishment of sin. And they will not justify you before God. Our obedience doesn't produce God's grace. I want to say this to you. Our obedience doesn't produce God's grace, but it is God's grace on us that produces obedience. <laughs> Make sure you get that one right. And so my dad, I mentioned just a moment ago, he died May 12th. May 12th would be 14 years. It was this, this year, 14 years ago. And so I was mentioning earlier that I'm 47, and he was 50 when he died, and so he'd be 64 years old today. And so if you're in the room and you're 64, you could be my daddy. And if you're that old, can, can I borrow 20 bucks? <laughs> I just want, thought I might take my girl out, you know, get an ice cream. Maybe 40 bucks. I don't know. That, feel, that felt good to me. I mean, I, <laughs> no, I, I love my daddy. He had a great sense of humor and, um, Man, when I think about him being gone that many years, it's hard to believe he's been gone 14 years. And I remember him saying, he'd mumble, his disease that he had took him where he couldn't walk and talk. And you could barely understand him. And the closer he got to his death, the, the less you could understand him. And so he's slurred. It'd be like encountering someone who's plastered. If you ever done that, that couldn't walk, talk, or you just couldn't, I mean, just that, that was how he was that's what the disease did to him and so but he'd I'd get around him and say son I believe I don't believe it like I used to I believe in the grace of God <laughs> who he says big enough and to be honest with you I let him go on quoting sometimes what seemed like chapters he just quote chapter after chapter and through the slur of his words his vocal cords being so restricted I'm telling you, you couldn't understand him unless you'd been with him for a long time, but I did. And he'd say, I believe in the grace of God. And here's what I remember thinking, that the disease had affected his mind. And that somehow he had slipped a little with his ability to understand. And so then I was trusting that the grace of God would cover him for that slippage. <laughs> and I thought to myself, okay, Dad, you can quote and go on about that and because I was worried, I was concerned, and to be honest with you, I was performance-based. And so I counted on the grace of God to cover him and his disease because the closer he got to death, the more he proclaimed grace to me and my mom and everybody else. I believe in the grace of God is what he said. And I say, oh, yeah, I hear you, Dad. And so I thought he'd fallen off the wagon, but I didn't know God had one more message. Listen, I talk about my dad, and I admire my dad, So, but he wasn't perfect, okay? <laughs> Far from it. But he taught me how to pray. Him and that woman right there, they prayed for hours. They didn't talk about praying. They actually prayed, and they prayed in front of me and my sister, and they did that many days, many times, many hours, and that was just a part of their life. And then he taught me the value of the Word of God and what it meant to the power of the Scripture. I remember taking little trips in the car, and uh, we didn't have cell phones or video games or anything like that. And so one of the games we played was I'd sit in the back seat, and I'd take my Bible, and I'd just thumb through it, you know, just thumb through it. And wherever my finger stopped, I would read that Scripture. And when I read that Scripture, my dad on most occasions could tell me that's in the book of so-and-so, Habakkuk, or whatever it was. And then sometimes, a lot of times, he could tell me that's in John chapter 3. And then a lot more times, he would say, that's John chapter 3, verse 5. And then he would continue to quote it to me. That's how much he devoured the Scripture. So he taught me that. And so he, he to, to love the Word of God and to know the power. But then he would say, son, in his distorted voice as I got older, as he got closer to his death, right, he would just simply say, I believe in God's grace and here's what he said you will too and one of his favorite things to say was you'll see you'll see there's power in the grace of God I want to be clear. I'm not preaching this because my daddy did. I promise you. 
I was blown away in this last month when I remembered and I saw him and I saw, I remember my posture. I'm like, oh, by the grace of God. You'll see. But I'm not preaching it because of my daddy. I want to tell you like this. I'm preaching it because I have seen something that I cannot unsee. I can't put it back in a box. I've been changed in ways I really don't have the words to express how. I'm not who I was. I thank God for that. I desperately want to join the ranks of Paul and all the others who have gone before me. And I want to preach and declare that we are saved through faith. We are saved through grace, through faith, not of works, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. It is his gift to give. So Paul says in Galatians 3, verse 2, let me ask you this one thing. Do you receive the spirit of works? Do you receive the spirit by works or by the law? Uh, works of the law or by hearing with faith, excuse me. Tell me one thing. Let me get this straight. What you're trying to say is, <laughs> do you experience the presence of the living God because of how works, the, the good works that you do? Or are you experiencing because you heard the words of Christ and you believe? This morning we are under the hand of God. We're in the presence of God. Which one of you brought him here? Which one of you performed such great works that God said, I'm coming today on your behalf? Or is God here? Are we experiencing him because of faith in him? The Bible says in Genesis that darkness laid on the face of the deep. The earth was void and without form. And the Spirit of God hovered over it, ready to bring life and beauty. And listen, the Spirit of God did bring life and beauty. He created the sun, the moon, the earth, the stars, the trees, the universe, and all the living creatures. And just like the Spirit of God moved on the deep waters in the beginning, the Spirit of God is still hovering over dark places, hovering over wicked people with the purpose and the intention of replacing darkness with light, restoring brokenness with healing, bringing back lost treasures of our heart. The Spirit of God is the invisible, powerful presence of the one who gives us life. The one who gives life to all of creation. He is the sustainer of life. It is the personal presence of God, the Holy Spirit that was sent, the comforter that guides us and teaches us all things. And it's through the Holy Spirit that we interact in the presence of the living God. Do you experience the gift of God's Spirit by obeying works of the flesh or by faith in his word? Can you believe it? God is here. He's here. How did we make that happen? What did we do? Think about it. What did we do? What did you do? You got it wrong, probably. <laughs> you messed it up, probably. If it's in your hands, it wouldn't happen, but it's his love for you that he came this morning for you. Do you believe it? Romans 10 says this. The man could come. But what does it say? In verse 8, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him from whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news.
Then verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This morning we are not alone because he promised us to not be alone. We have hope this morning because he promised us hope. So there's a key in this. If you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, please forgive me. I don't believe you confessed with your mouth 25 years ago. I'm saying confess with your mouth every moment of every day you ever think about it. God, I am not enough, but you are more than enough. Lord, you are Lord of my life. You are King of kings. You are the creator. I surrender my thoughts to you, my ways to you. Have my life. I need you. Confess with your mouth and then believe in your heart that he is enough. He's more than enough. So let me finish reading some of these verses to you just real quick. He picks up in chapter 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? What happened? Did you suffer so many things in vain? It was in, if it was indeed in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do so by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? And then he says, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know this. Know this. That it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Paul asked in verse 2, tell me one thing, is salvation by works or by faith? And then in verse 7, he answers that question, know this, those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Now what's that mean? We're going to dive into that in a lot more depth next week. To be a son of Abraham is to be a son of the promise, to have an inheritance, to have an inheritance. Right? You can't just get someone's inheritance. You got to be named in the will. You got to be adopted. You got to be brought in. And there's got to be some paperwork that somebody says, that's my son. And this is what Paul's preaching. He's saying, when you believe in Jesus, you become a son to Abraham. And this was the promise to Abraham. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless many nations through you. I'm going to save them and I'm going to deliver them. So you might be a son or daughter of selfish living, prone to every sin, and trapped by a lifestyle that's left you in shambles. Maybe it's left you home, your home. You got a broken home, broken relationships, broken family, broken finances, broken joy, broken hope. You've been labeled an outcast, a drug addict, an alcoholic, a prostitute, a liar, a cheater. But I want to tell you that faith in Jesus Christ this morning will take that old reputation away from you. And he will make you a son of Abraham. And you will become an inheritor to the Father, to the promise of the Father. I got to finish saying this. Uh, one last thing. We're all destined for hell without the blood of Jesus. Eternal separation from God. And we're all going to get what we deserve without the blood of Jesus. But if we confess with our mouths and believe with our hearts, Jesus, I can't do it. That's what it sounds like. Go ahead. If you're in this room, say, I can't do it. I admit it. You're the only one who can. If we confess these things and believe that in our heart, we will be saved. And then I get to say, welcome to the family of God. Welcome, you child of Abraham, the one that's going to inherit, it, inherit the promise of the Father. So then I want to say to you this, go and sin no more. Huh? That seems impossible. Go and quit living a selfish life. Quit living a life that's so self-centered and all about pleasure and all about your experience. And I challenge you this morning to live a life that's surrendered on the altar of God as an act of worship. That says, Lord, I lay down whatever I have. Maybe you're here and you feel like I've squandered all my life. Maybe you look back and you've got nothing but damaged goods behind you and you think there's no hope for me. Listen, whatever years you've got, God has numbered our days. God, whatever days I have left, I give them to you and watch what he does with it. Watch what he does with it. He loves you this morning. He is reaching you. You are not reaching him. So thank God. Because he will accomplish his goal. So generous. So faithful you are. And just for a moment, can we worship? Such an awesome God. 
so mighty, so holy, so wonderful. That's it. Such an awesome God, so selfless. <laughs> So, hear that generous, so faithful. Oh, go ahead, just for me. You have a song to sing. Such a now. While we're singing, I want you to sing your song just for a moment. Nobody knows your story like you do. Nobody knows what you've been contemplating. Nobody knows what you've been wrestling with. Nobody knows the secret sin that lies at your heart, sin. Just make it all about you. And you've been wrestling and fighting with that. Nobody knows it but you, but God. It's the grace of God that's kept you. It's the grace of God that will keep you in the morning and will protect you tomorrow night. And so sing that song. Sing this song out of your heart. Wonderful. Such an awe. Come on, sing it one more time. God. So mighty, so holy, so wonderful, such an awesome God, so, so selfless, so, so gentle. I feel it, Lord, we feel you. That's no small so thing. Father, I pray for every person in this room right now, God. Every heart, every soul. Forgive me for relying on myself. I'm terrible at that. I'm terrible. I just confess that I, more than anybody, I want to, I want to rely on me. I want to depend on what I can do. If I've ever seen anything, I see it today so clearly. I repent of that, God. I repent of my self-reliance. I repent of thinking or believing that I could play a part, that I could make it happen. Lord, I'm blessed by the grace. You'll see. Lord, I thank you for your tenderness, and your kindness, and your generosity. Thank you, Lord, for the heart that's here this morning. You might say, I, you might be realizing I, I've been serving religion and not God. All is not lost. All is not lost. That's between you and Him. Go ahead and lay that at His feet. Say, God, I just want, a, I want a true experience with you. I don't want a church name. I don't want a church badge or label. Jesus, I want to know you. I want to know what it's like to visit with you when no one else is around, to feel your presence, to hear you whisper to me, God, to speak clarity. God, to give me freedom. God, to help me help others. I want to know what that's like. Lead me, guide me, teach me, teach me. And give me the grace. Give me the grace to share. I just want to share grace. I want to pour grace. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We thank you for every person in this room. I pray that your Holy Spirit, that their presence that we feel even now would visit us in our cars, would visit us in our homes. God, would go with us when we're out at Walmart. Overwhelm us, God. Overwhelm us. Behind lifted up. Behind lifted up. You are holy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb of God. God, may we live lives that are surrendered to you. May it be a privilege, a joy, a joy to find ourselves in a moment of repenting with you. You're so good. You're so receptive. You're so, uh, listen, God, I just feel God just want to, I just feel the, like a ministering, I, like, like a dad would say to his son, or to come here and give me a hug. Come here. He loves you. He wants you to know you're going to get through this. You can get over this. You can let it be in the past. Let it be behind you. Let it be behind you. Today's a new day. It's a brand new day. You've not gone so far. You've not been so bad. He loves you. Not on your best day, but on your worst. We bless your name. So I've asked the band. They're going to worship for a moment.
We bless you guys. We realize that it's, it's time and that you've got kids you've got to go get, so we don't want to hold up kids' ministry, but we bless you guys. Carry an atmosphere of worship with you as you go, please. And if you want to hang out and sing with us, we invite you to do that as well. Bless you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next Sunday. So faithful you are. Awesome God. Awesome God. Awesome God.